Welcome to Canada's podcast, the number one podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome to Calgary's podcast on Canada's podcast network. I'm your host, Mario Taniguzzi, and joining me today is Alexandra Daniel, who is the founder and CEO of Sargessa in Calgary. Thanks for joining us today, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Well, let me just start by asking you, Alexandra, what is Sargessa? What, uh, what do you guys do? So we're a tea company that raises awareness for domestic violence and funds a local shelter here in the city with some of our profits. We use a combination of Canadian grown um, herbs as well as international fair trade teas to make our products. How did you, uh, well, let me uh, just ask, when did you first start this? I started it um, three and a half years ago when I was a university student. What were you taking at university? English. Oh, wow. <laughs> so what? Uh, so tell me the story behind how you started the company and why. So as part of my degree, I was doing a minor in Indigenous Studies. And I was in this phenomenal course led by Dr. Renee Watchman from Mount Royal University. And in the course, we were challenged to bring resistance into our everyday experience. And we had been learning about the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit peoples crisis um, that is really, really terrible and is happening across Canada. And one day I was at my favorite local coffee shop and I looked down at their line of teas and I started to think that, you know, I can buy products that support Indigenous farmers elsewhere in the world and small businesses, but there's no tea that really educates me about um, Canadian herbs as well as like raises awareness for important Canadian social issues. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of how Sargessa came to be. I made it as a prototype for a class project where I worked with um, an Indigenous artist as well as connected with two elders to learn about the herbs and ingredients in the tea. And then I presented it. And after that, the project just kind of took hold of me and I couldn't stop. Cool. So, uh, so where does the name come from and what's the significance of the name for the company? So we actually started with a different name, Solidaire Teas, and I ran into a trademarking issue. Mm. And so I had to rename it and I was in a bit of a pinch for time. So I started looking through my English textbooks and finding sounds that I felt really were beautiful and worked um, when I thought about tea. And then... It became, it started out as, um, I think we started with Sargasso, which is a, like, one of my favorite books is Wide Sargasso Sea. And we couldn't name it that because it's like such a common name and it was already taken. And then we start, then we start playing around with words and like looking at um, different translations. And there was a couple that we couldn't use because one of them meant spit in a different language. <laughs> and finally we landed on Sargessa. And I was so worried and I didn't want to give up like the original name and i was sitting with my grandmother um as well as like another community elder and i had brought this up to them separately and both of them had said it's such a beautiful feminine name and it can represent like the spirit of all of these women who are experiencing domestic violence and kind of the dancer on your packaging and so that's how the name came to be and how many different uh, herbs do you use for taste oh well we try and use at least one canadian ingredient per tea but for some um, blends like our chai tea, we use like multiple spices. The Canadian grown herb is rose hip, but um, we have five flavors and then we probably have about 40 ingredients total. Oh, okay. That's super. Um, and and uh, do you, this tea is sold where? Like uh... You can buy it at Sobeys and Safeways as well as like um, small cafes and boutiques across Canada. It's all on our website, too, if people are interested. Okay. And you mentioned um, uh, working and supporting a, a, a community organization. Uh, can you explain that, uh, which one it is and why? So we donate 20% of our profits to the Awatan Healing Lodge Society. And they are a phenomenal women's shelter where they are grounded in Indigenous frameworks and teachings. Um, but they're really open to like all women from different cultures. And they have just been such a force in Calgary with like 
uh, remembering women who've experienced domestic violence and the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, as well as really advocating for the rights of families and looking at like holistic family based um, supports for like trauma survivors. Okay, so uh, tell me maybe a little bit more about uh, personally yourself, why why this is so important to you, why this touches uh, touches you, uh, you know, this, this issue. So I'm a mixed race, Indo-Caribbean Canadian woman. Um, my mom and her family is from Trinidad and England, and my dad's side of the family is French Canadian. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been um, a large amount of domestic violence in the Indo-Caribbean community, a lot of which um, is hypothesized to um, come from our experience of indentureship. So like working on the sugarcane plantations. And so it was something that I experienced and heard stories about growing up. Mm. And so when I first encountered, um, like learning about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, it struck a chord with me because even though we are complicit as settlers and like live on um, indigenous land, we, we also have our own experience of colonialism and our own intersecting history. And so I was interested in how we have similar experiences, but how can we come together in solidarity and like really work to overcome these issues as a larger community that has to live and work together? Mm -hmm. Okay. How has uh, business been for you like uh, since you started? Business has been really good. Um, last year, we had like a major growth year. We moved into our own factory space. So we were able to like upsize our manufacturing capabilities as well as uh, work on sourcing more ingredients. And that was really exciting. So everything is done uh, in your manufacturing plant here in Calgary? Yep. So we make biodegradable tea bags um, in our in-house and mm. just, we have so much fun. Um, tell me also a little bit about how, um, I, I guess, formula for last, lack of a better word, uh, who comes up with uh, these ideas for the kinds of teas that you sell? Well, I do. In the original days, it was just like, as a university student, it was me in my kitchen mixing teas together yeah. with my grandmother. And she would teach me a little bit about like what we use and like why we use the um, different spices and what things I couldn't put into tea. And we tasted lots of bad batches of tea, things that were just like not ideal. And then now we have our like five staple flavors and then we work as a team to sort of develop new recipes as well as like really looking into how the herbs are grown and um, what we can do to increase flavor or like, um, you know, sometimes how a tea is grown really impacts its flavor. Mm. And so we might have to, we might have a recipe or a formulation in mind and try like several different suppliers for the same tea to really get that, like the taste that we want. We want people to open up these bags and be like blown away by the smell and the flavor. Excellent. What has been the biggest challenge for you uh, being a, an entrepreneur and, uh, and starting up a business? I think it's challenging to really train your mind to overcome problems and to um, just really be focused when you're like coming up against a challenge. I think a lot of people don't have techniques or ways of solving problems mm -hmm. and it can be really easy to just hit a problem and be like, I'm going to just give up or I'm not going to like push forward or I'm going to try a different way instead of like really looking at, well, how might this be solved and going through it like really um, syst sy systemically. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when uh, you were setting up uh, or even, you know, to this, this day, when you look back, I'm sure a lot of people gave you a lot of advice. Uh, does anything stick with you as sort of the best piece of advice uh, you received on being an entrepreneur and running a business? You know, I don't know if it's advice per se. I, in my, like, I work in the daytime at the Trico Charitable Foundation, but oh. I actually started as a summer student for them um, working on my venture. 
And they have like a whole bunch of tools and resources to help build your capacity and like really learn how to um, solve your own problems and bring in what we call friendly wise skeptics, which is like people with technical skills. You can ask like the nitty gritty questions. And I think the best thing you can do as an entrepreneur is really differentiate between general mentors who can like mentor you on how to like be professional in this phase. And then people with technical skills you need to solve very specific problems. Like, for example, uh, peppermint root chemistry. It's like not every business mentor is going to have that specific skill and yeah. you're going to have to look for people with those expertise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you, uh, uh, you know, obviously being an entrepreneur uh, takes a lot of time and effort, and et cetera. Uh, you're also doing something else. Uh, where do you find the time for it, for this? I think that when you have like really good systems in place, it just um, the time is is there. And like when you have a limited amount of time or like constraints, say I have weekends and evenings to do my business. And I don't particularly resonate with the term side hustle with Sardessa because yeah. I love it so much. And I like the goal is to change the world with tea. Um, but when you have those specific constraints, you have to be really careful with how you manage your time and really dedicated. And you have to learn to delegate. It's not helpful for me to do all of the different pieces. And I'm lucky to have like a great team who can be doing different things when I'm not there. Yeah. Okay, then. And um, in terms of, you know, everybody talks about work life balance these days. Uh, um, everybody's busy with work a lot of times. How do you juggle that, uh, you know, your work life balance? And, and I guess, what do you do outside of work? So, Work life balance is tricky because I don't think, I think you kind of get to a state where all of the things you do are in alignment and yeah. it all sort of flows together. So you're not experiencing that burnout because it just feels like a natural cycle and progression. Um, and that is one of the biggest learnings for me is like, I thought in the beginning I needed to be so like balanced, like I needed to have a certain amount of time set aside for like uh, wellness or like yeah. mental health care, those sorts of things. But when you're doing something you love and you're setting good parameters within it so that you're um, delegating where you need to do, what you need to do and the pieces that you can, as well as like finding joy in it. Yeah. It's, it's really, a, it doesn't become that big of an issue. Yeah. At least it hasn't for me. Um, one of the things that I love to do is read. And so, I recently read a book called Burnout, which talks about completing the stress cycle. And that was really helpful for me in understanding, you know, there are times where I get really tired and I just don't want to do things. Yeah. And that's okay. And I just have to complete that cycle to be able to uh, move forward in a good way. It's kind of like that old saying, right? That, that uh, if, you, if you're uh, working at uh, something you love, uh, it's not really work, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, reading. Uh, anything else that you do uh, to relax? I love to write. Um, when COVID is not happening, I do a lot of volunteering, uh, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Okay. I'm also a knitter. My grandmother says that when you have a really difficult problem, you should always have a really complicated knitting pattern on the go. Wow. Then you have something else to put your brain focusing on. Yeah. And you like just kind of decompress and then you can go back to the problem with fresh eyes what do you knit socks i knit sweaters <laughs> yeah i like i have a lot of unfinished knitting projects that are just there for like when i'm feeling like i need it yeah i guess everybody needs that outlet right uh, uh sometimes to take their minds off of uh everything else that's uh say important or serious right yes yeah okay um any advice that you would pass on to, uh, you, you know, I'm not going to ask you your age, uh, but uh, you're obviously uh, fairly young, uh, but any advice that you would give to fellow uh, young entrepreneurs out there uh, that want that are thinking or maybe want to embark on a journey of entrepreneurship? Um, I would say that when people encounter a problem or a challenge, Find somebody that you can ask how they solve the problem. 
I think that that is the most important thing. You can always ask people, um, like how, how they, what they did in different situations, but if they have no experience, um, or their context is different than the context you're coming from, it's yeah. really hard to match up those answers. Yeah. Okay. Super then. Well, thanks very much for joining us today, Alexandra. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, that was Alexandra Daniel, who is the founder and CEO of Sargessa in Calgary. This has been Calgary's podcast on Canada's Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mario Tonaguzzi. Thanks for joining us today.